I'm Curtis Robb, I'm the clinical lecturer here at the Royal Orthopaedic Hospital and I'm now going to show you an examination of the hands. This follows the normal pattern of look, feel, move, but the hand should not be considered alone. It is part of the upper limb and could, should be considered in conjunction with the neck, the shoulder, the elbow and the wrist. Having screened the neck and the shoulder, I would begin at the elbow. I look for any signs of psoriasis or rheumatoid nodules. I would then move on to the hands. I would begin by assessing from proximal to distal, looking at the dorsal aspect and then moving on to the volar aspect of the hand. Look for any deformity at the wrist, the metacarpophalangeal joints, the proximal interphalangeal joints and the distal interphalangeal joints. I also look for any scars, the condition of the nails, particularly for pitting and psoriasis, for any soft tissue swelling, for signs of a boutonnier deformity where there is flexion at the proximal interphalangeal joint and hyperextension at the distal interphalangeal joint, a swan neck deformity where there can be hyperextension deformity of the proximal interphalangeal joint and flexion of the distal interphalangeal joint. For signs on the velar aspect of Jupitron's disease, for shouldering at the first carpal metacarpal joint and wasting of the thena, the hyperthena or the intrinsic area at the dorsum of the hand. We will now move on to feel and we will go as usual from proximal to distal. I assess the wrist first, feeling the radial styloid and the ulnar styloid. Between these is the wrist joint. Here is the triangular fibrocartilaginous complex and distal to Lister's tubercle at this area is the scapholunate joint. I also assess the first dorsal compartment, which is here, at the site of de Quervain's tenosynovitis, and this is the area of tenderness where should they have tenosynovitis, pain will be elicited. I also feel at the first carpal metacarpal joint for signs of osteoarthritis. I feel the metacarpophalangeal joints, both in the fingers and in the thumb, the proximal interphalangeal joints and the distal interphalangeal joints. I also feel for the flexor tendons in the fingers. These areas may show signs of pain if there is a tenosynovitis, and sometimes you can feel a nodule at the site of the A1 pulley, which is at the distal transverse crease of the palm. I would then do a quick screen of movement of the wrist and the hand. Then get the patient to perform various maneuvers and copy myself. You put your wrist in this position, obtain full dorsiflexion, assess wrist flexion, then get the patient to put their arms by their side and assess supination and pronation. Then assess radial and ulnar deviation. This is radial deviation and ulnar deviation. The patient to make a clenched fist and an open arm, an open palm, and this will give you an idea of the cadence of the fingers. I would then, having assessed this, move on to more specialised tests. Having found where you think the pathology is, you should then direct your examination to either a neurological, a tendon, or a functional assessment. We'll start with the neurological assessment. Starting then, with the median nerve distribution. This is located on the radial border of the hand in the thumb, 
the index and the middle finger. You should therefore check sensation in the autonomous zone, which is the sensation over the tip of the index finger. You then assess power by assessing abductor pollicis brevis. You get the patient to keep their thumb abducted in this position and check the power of abductor pollicis brevis. You should then perform a direct compression test over the carpal tunnel. Any pain and pathology in the carpal tunnel will reproduce symptoms on the radial border of the hand by direct compression over the carpal tunnel area. This can be assessed again by Tinnell's test, tapping over the carpal tunnel. Carpal tunnel syndrome can also be assessed by Phelan's test, maintaining the elbow in an extended position with wrist flexion will increase pressure in the carpal tunnel and patient symptoms will be reproduced again in the median nerve distribution of the hand and this position should be maintained for one minute uh, to ensure that there either is or is no pathology in the carpal tunnel. The anterior interosseous nerve can be assessed by getting the patient to perform an O sign, ensuring that there is flexion at the flexor pollicis longus, the interphalangeal joint of the thumb, and the flexor digitorum profundus is, is working by providing flexion at the distal interphalangeal joint. If there is an anterior interosseous nerve palsy, the patient will perform a Kylo Nevin sign, indicated uh, by lack of flexion in the, dist in the distal phalanx of the finger and the interphalangeal joint of the thumb. The ulnar nerve can be assessed, again starting with sensation in the autonomous zone, little finger. Power can be assessed by the intrinsic muscles of the hand and you get the patient to abduct the fingers and you provide resistance and ensure that the abductors of the hand are working, indicating that there is no pathology in the ulnar nerve. Froman's test can be assessed by asking the patient to hold a piece of card between their thumb and their hand and the patient's arm supinated. Paper should be slid between the thumb and the hand and the patient asked to keep the paper in this position. The ability to do so indicates that the adductor policies is working. Should this be incompetent, the patient will demonstrate flexion of the interphalangeal joint of the thumb and the paper is retained by this means, indicating that the ulnar nerve is injured in some way. You should also assess the ulnar nerve again, working from proximal to distal. It should be assessed at the elbow by direct compression at the cubital tunnel behind the medial epicondyle. Tinnell's test can be used here to assess for tingling in the distal ulnar nerve distribution. You should also perform a flexion test at the elbow, which will compress the ulnar nerve, and you should maintain the wrist in extension uh, to ensure that the carpal tunnel syndrome symptoms aren't reproduced. And if this is positive, the patient will get tingling in the ulnar nerve distribution of the forearm and the hand. Distally, the ulnar nerve can be injured in the Guyon's canal. This is located between the hook of the hamate and the pisiform. Again, you can perform a direct compression test to reproduce pain and symptoms in the ulnar nerve distribution of the fingers or a Tinnell's test in this area. A high or a low ulnar nerve lesion can be elicited by assessing the sensation at the dorsum of the hand. The dorsal cutaneous branch is given off five centimeters proximal to the wrist. Therefore, if the injury occurs to the ulnar nerve at the wrist, the sensation to the dorsal ulnar aspect of the hand will be intact. The radial nerve can be assessed by the sensation to the first dorsal web space and the power by resisted wrist extension. 
feeling for the tone in the forearm. Function of the hand is assessed by a variety of different grips. A fine grip is assessed by asking the patient to pick up a coin. Tripod grip by asking them to write with a pen. Key pinch by asking them to use a key to open a door. Power grip by asking them to squeeze your fingers. And a hook grip by asking them to make a hook position and assess their degree of power. We then move on to a tendon assessment. I would advise checking each tendon in isolation. The thumb can be assessed by abductor pollicis longus, placing the thumb in abduction, resist and providing resistance, abductor pollicis brevis by providing resistance in the proximal phalanx, extensor pollicis longus by asking the patient to lift their thumb off, off the table, extensor pollicis brevis by asking by resisting the patient uh, at the proximal phalanx and asking them again to, res to provide extension and flexor pollicis longus by asking them to flex at the interphalangeal joint of the thumb. The fingers can be assessed by examining the interossei. If you ask the patient to spread the fingers and stop you from pushing them together the flexor digitorum profundus should be examined by holding the proximal interphalangeal joint in extension and asking them to bend the distal interphalangeal joint for each finger. And the flexor digitorum superficialis tendon can be assessed by holding the other fingers in extension and asking them to bend at the proximal interphalangeal joint. The extensors of each finger can be assessed by asking the patient to hold their fingers in extension. You can also see the extensors working nicely. The wrist extensors can be assessed by asking the patient to extend at the wrist, keeping their hand in a clench position, and extend at the wrist and resist forward flexion of the wrist while palpating extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis in the second dorsal compartment of the wrist. The extensor carpi ulnaris can be evaluated by asking the patient to resist wrist extension with ulnar deviation. The patient again in wrist extension, dorsiflex of the wrist, and place it in ulnar deviation, and then get the patient to keep their arm in that position, palpating again over the extensor carpi ulnaris, ensuring it's intact. We can then move on to more specialised tests. Finkelstein's test can be assessed by palpating for pain over the first dorsal compartment, getting the patient to place their, their thumb in the, in the palm, and moving the wrist into ulnar deviation and this will reproduce the patient's symptoms in the first dorsal compartment where they may have a diagnosis of de Quervain's tenovaginitis. Osteoarthritis at the first carpometacarpal joint can be elicited by the axial grind test. This is where the corpus is stabilised and the metacarpal of the thumb is axially ground against the trapezium, and this will elicit pain if there is first carpometacarpal osteoarthritis. The scapholunate ligament can be assessed by Kirk Watson's test. If you have the patient with a flexed elbow, you palpate the pole of the scaphoid, which is just distal to ECR. You then place your finger over the 
proximal pole of the scaphoid and your thumb over the dorsum of the wrist and you then deviate from the ulna to the radial border of the hand and you'll feel the proximal pole of the scaphoid at the dorsum of the hand snapping back should the scapholunate ligament be incompetent. Allen's test can be assessed by including the radial and the ulnar arteries and asking the patient to make a fist twice. This empties the blood from the hand. You then release the ulnar artery and you should see the blood return to the hand. You then put your pressure over the ulnar artery again. Ask the patient to make a fist twice. Release the radial artery and again you should see the flow of blood back to the hand. If this is incompetent in any way, it may demonstrate that there is insufficient blood supply from either the radial or the ulnar artery to the hand. I'm Curtis Robb. I'm a clinical lecturer here at the Royal Orthopaedic Hospital. And today I'll be running through the foot and ankle examination. We have our patient and it's important to begin with inspection. Assess if the patient has any walking aids. Have a look at their shoes for patterns of wear, their spine for any evidence of a spinal deformity or a hairy patch, which may indicate a spinal dysraphism, and the legs for the overall limb alignment. Sarah, could I ask you to stand up, please? For the leg alignment, you should look for any varus or valgus. You should then ask the patient to take a few steps so you can have a look at their gait pattern. Would you like to do that for me? When this is done, you should look to see if they have the three rockers of gait, which are heel strike, mid stance and toe off, ensuring that they are symmetrical and even throughout. I'd like to stand here for me, please, Sarah. You should also then assess the foot in a functional weight bearing position. Having a look at the overall foot alignment, any signs of pes planus or cabus by assessing the medial longitudinal arch, and the forefoot alignment for any hallux deformity and any deformity of the lesser toes. Of course, you should always assess for any scars, swelling, or erythema. You should then assess the patient by looking from behind with them facing the wall. Sarah, would you like to do that for me, please? In this position, you should look at the calf musculature to assess for any wasting. You should also look to see if the patient has the too many toes sign. Normally, from the back of the ankle, you should be able to see two lesser toes. Any more than this may indicate a posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. You can then ask the patient to perform a bilateral heel raise. Sarah, could you do that for me, please? In this position, the heel goes from a normal valgus attitude into inversion, hind foot varus. And you can see in this case, the, if you go down again and then back up, the heel goes from valgus into varus. You should then get the patient to perform this by a single heel raise. Could you do this on your left leg, please, sir? And the heel goes from valgus, if you go further, and it goes into varus. And again on the right leg. Any problems with this may indicate either a neurological, a muscular, or a posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. You should then ask the patient to take a seat and examine the foot and ankle more closely. It's important for any orthopaedic examination to continue with the theme of look, feel and move. Taking a closer look at the foot, you can assess for scars, swelling, subluxation of the lesser metatarsal heads, signs of a bunion or indeed a bunionette. You can also assess between the toes for any ulceration 
or callosities beneath the foot at the forefoot underneath the first metatarsal head or the lesser metatarsals callosities in the midfoot and the hind foot and these will indicate the pattern of gait you should then ask the patient if they're painful anywhere and then move on to feel feel around the tender achilles for pain feel around the perineal tendons the lateral malleolus the lateral ankle joint line the anterior ankle joint the medial ankle joint the medial malleolus the posterior tibial tendon down to its insertion the plantar fascia area for signs of plantar fasciitis the sinus tarsi beneath the lateral malleolus the base of the fifth metatarsal the extensor tendons over a prominent bunion beneath the lesser metatarsal heads or over a bunionette should then move on to assessing the range of movement this should be done from a proximal to a distal direction assessing the ankle range of movement it's important to distinguish between the ankle and the mid tarsal movement you should assess dorsiflexion and plantar flexion you should then assess subtalar movement by stabilizing the talus with one hand and then moving the hind foot to inversion and eversion the mid tarsal movement can be assessed by stabilizing the midfoot placing the foot into adduction or abduction the first metatarsal movement can be assessed by st again stabilizing the midfoot and depressing the first metatarsal you can also assess the range of movement of the hallux and the lesser metatarsals moving on to assess the tendon function the posterior tibial tendon can be assessed by getting the foot into a plantar flexed and inverted position here you can see that the posterior tibial tendon is working nicely explain to the patient to hold that foot in that position and hold it like stone you can then resist uh, pressure on the medial side of the foot whilst palpating the tendon and this will give you an indication of the posterior tibial tendon function. The perineal tendons can be assessed by getting the patient to place their foot in a dorsiflexed and everted manner. This will then show you the perineal tendons. Again, get the patient to hold their foot like stone and resist your movement. You can then palpate the perineal tendons and assess their function. Similarly, the tibialis anterior can be assessed by asking the patient to dorsiflex the ankle and invert. Again, you can see the tibialis anterior tendon working nicely. Explain to the patient, hold the foot like stone, don't let me move it, and you can get a good idea of the tendon function. Ankle instability can be assessed by the anterior draw test. This is performed with the foot relaxed and in a plantar flex position. One hand should be used to stabilise the tibia and the other hand to draw the hind foot forward. This will indicate the competence of the anterior talofibular ligament laterally. 
the lateral ligamentous complex can also be assessed by getting the patient to invert the foot and you can feel the lateral ligamentous complex just beneath the lateral malleolus. Any excessive opening up of this site may demonstrate incompetence. Any signs of osteoarthritis at the first metatarsophalangeal joint can be assessed by the axial grind test. This is a painful test, so you should be careful and always check the patient's face whilst performing it. You actually load the hallux and grind the first metatarsophalangeal joint, assessing the patient's face to make sure that they're not in undue pain. This will be an indication of hallux rigidus. You can also assess the, t the tender Achilles function and this should be performed by doing Simmons manoeuvre. The patient should be prone and you, you should have the, the foot in a relaxed manner. You should then passively squeeze the calf muscle and you should see plantar flexion of the foot provided the tender Achilles is intact. Should there be a rupture of the tender Achilles, the foot will not plantar flex when the calf is squeezed. When the calf is squeezed, you can see here, the tender Achilles is functioning as the foot is going into plantar flexion. Finally, if you do have a patient with a pes cavus deformity, in all likelihood, they will have a hind foot varus abnormality. The flexibility of this can be assessed with the Coleman block test. Here again, we have our patient with a hind foot in varus. You then position the patient on a wooden block and allow the first metatarsal head to be depressed. And then you can see that the hind foot goes from a varus into a valgus position and this indicates that the hind foot is flexible and there's movement at the subtalar joint. As with any orthopedic examination, you should always assess the vascular and neurological status to complete your examination. I'm now going to take you through a quick run through of the hand examination. You should not consider it in its entirety. We need to make sure that we've already screened the neck, the shoulder and the elbow. Begin by looking at the elbow. There's no signs of psoriasis or rheumatoid nodules. No deformities at the wrist. No swelling over the dorsum of the hand. No metacarpophalangeal deformity. No deformity at the proximal to phalangeal joints or the distal to phalangeal joints. And there's no scars and no pitting of the nails. There's no signs of any Jupitrons contracture, nor any deformity of the fingers in the form of a boutonnier or a swan neck deformity. There's no shouldering of the first carp metacarpal joint. I cannot see any wasting of the hypothena or thena areas, and nor is there any guttering in the dorsum of the hand for, uh, for intrinsic wasting. Feeling around the wrist, there's no tenderness at the dorsum of the wrist. There's no tenderness at the radial styloid over the queer veins area. There's no tenderness at the triangular fibrocartilage complex nor the scaphalunate joint. There's no tenderness at the first carpal metacarpal joint, the metacarpophalangeal joints, the proximal interphalangeal joints, the distal interphalangeal joints, or the flexor tendons of the palm. To get a composite movement of the hand and assess the function, the patient to dorsiflex the wrist, plantar flex the wrist, tuck their elbows in by the side, perform full supination and full pronation. Radial and ulnar deviation a clenched fist and an open palm and again there is no deformity and she has normal cadence. 
Should you find any abnormality, you should then move on to more specialised tests, as we've previously mentioned.